very warm welcome to you this afternoon as we gather for our midweek service. Welcome to those of you who are here for the service or watching this online. I apologise it didn't go up last week on time, so it will, two will go up together today, as you've discovered if you're watching this. But welcome to those of you who are here in person in front of me. Um, let's take a moment then, just as we begin our worship. If I haven't met you before, sorry by the way, I think I know you all. Uh, yeah, I don't need to introduce myself. I'm Alistair Duncan, minister here at St George's Tron, but good to be with you. Let's take a moment then just to pray and still ourselves as we come to worship together. Loving God, our Father, thank you for this time and space. Thank you for the peace and the beauty of a spring day, for the warmth outside and all the little encouragements to us after a bleak season. Lord, as we seek your face in this place, as we sing your praise, as we listen for your word, may you make your presence known in our midst. Would you glorify your name? Would you speak through your word? And would you, Lord, live within us through your word and by your spirit, that we may be strengthened for our journey beyond this time and space. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to sing two verses of the hymn, Teach Me Thy Way, O Lord, and then we'll sing the other two verses as we usually do at the end of the service. And can I just remind you we're still obliged to wear masks for singing, unfortunately. Hopefully by the beginning of April that will have changed. But if we can do that, that's a, a courtesy and consideration, especially when there is actually so much COVID around. I don't know about you, but I know rather a lot of people who've got it, had it or are recovering from it. So we're still trying to protect one another. If you could please wear your mask, that would be helpful. So let's worship together. So let's pray again, and this time we include the words of the Lord's Prayer. Lord, teach us your way, we pray, because we forget so easily and so quickly. We thank you for your patience with us, Lord. Time after time, you've reminded us in your word of the simple principles of grace, of forgiveness. You've reminded us again, Lord, of our sinfulness and shortcoming and pointed us to the cross that we may find help and mercy and salvation through Jesus. But Lord, so easily we turn to our own way, what we want, our own selfish ambitions and pursuits, and gently and patiently, and sometimes, Lord, robustly, you turn us back to yourself. You call us back to the way of faith, to the life of repentance, and to a discipleship marked not by ourselves, but by taking up our cross, as Jesus did. So as we turn to you in the middle of the week, we come and ask forgiveness for our sins, for what we've done and left undone, for, Lord, what we have uh, failed to be in your eyes or in the eyes of others, and for the ways, Lord, in which our old fallen natures have got the better of us. Lord, forgive and cleanse us, we pray. In this Lenten season, as we journey towards the cross, help us to reflect upon what it meant that we might consider ourselves forgiven and what it cost you, Lord, to make that possible for us. So, Lord, hear us as we pray, be in our midst as we worship, and as now we join our voices together as one in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So we're going to read today's passage again. It's a longer one. I'm trying to whistle through some of the major journeys of the Bible that contribute to the big picture journey from Genesis to Revelation. And so there's some key moments 
that we're covering, and we're covering them fairly briskly, as you would expect. And I didn't. Uh, the book of the story of the Exodus from Egypt, of course, is an entire book in the Bible, <laughs> and we're just going to touch on that story today. So let's read Exodus 14, 1 to 31, which is the core story of the actual exodus from Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, and so on. Let's hear God's word to us today. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and camp near pi Hahiroth, between Migdol and the sea. They are to camp by the sea directly opposite baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near pi Hahiroth, opposite baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. 
And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Amen. I know it's a long reading, but it's good to capture the whole story. We're looking at journeys in the season of Lent. Two weeks ago, we looked at the story of Abram and Sarah, an elderly couple called in the evening of their lives to leave the known and the familiar, to uproot themselves from familiar territory and their wider family, and to travel on an unknown journey with an unknown destination with God's promise that they would have descendants and that their descendants would be a source of blessing. There was every good reason why they should not do it. The tantalizing prospect of descendants took a lot of faith since they were well past childbearing years. And so Abram and Sarah, in the evening of their lives, trusted God and set out on a journey which would change the history of the world. Last week we thought about Joseph and his journey, sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers, who were jealous of his favoured position with their father, and who got rid of him. And Joseph's journey, which begins with arrogance and pride, his prophetic gift leading him to uh, vaunt himself over his siblings and even his parents, and whilst ultimately the prophecies came to pass, it was a long and painful road for Joseph to travel from that place of youthful arrogance to the place where as a mature man, hardened and come through the crucible of suffering to experience the truth uh, of what God had promised. And so Joseph emerges at the end of the story as somebody who has a position of influence, but it's been hard won through long years of suffering and long years of struggle and of patient waiting. This week, we come to the dramatic story of the Exodus. It's the birth narrative of God's people, Israel. It tells the story of how the family that settled in Egypt under Joseph when his brothers and father were reunited and they settled there because of the favor that Joseph had come to experience, now became a nation. And after hundreds of years, 430 years, they settled, uh, being settled there, they now left. And so 430 years on, they were now slaves in Egypt, no longer enjoying the favored position they'd known under Joseph. They'd cried out in their slavery and their suffering, and God had heard their cry and their prayer. And God had rescued or come to their rescue, sending first a series of plagues as warnings under Moses, and then finally following the plague upon the firstborn, where the firstborn son of every Egyptian household died, leading out the people of Israel in this dramatic story. The story is full of drama. When we read, uh, if you've ever seen the, 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 the animated film, The Prince of Egypt, you'll know how, what a dramatic moment they make out of the exodus of Moses holding his staff over the water and the waters springing back instantly and creating uh, a path for them to go through. But of course, it wasn't really like that. And whilst the story of the, uh, the exodus as told in a film like that is, is full of uh, color and drama and adventure, what's not really captured necessarily all that well is the sheer dread and fear of the people. I wonder if the reality of the exodus had more in common with the current situation in Ukraine. A huge number of frightened, terrified people many of them trying to escape bullying oppressors who are intent on their pursuit and murder. Certainly, the story of Exodus marks the beginning of another journey, a long journey, a journey of 40 years through the wilderness until they would enter the promised land. But it's a journey that begins with this great drama. The events of the Exodus are the foundation stone of God calling and establishing a people. In fact, I don't know if you've ever reflected upon it before, but
but actually the passage of those people through the waters of the Red Sea, you might liken to a natural birth. The passage through the Red Sea being like a birth canal and God's people emerging out of the other side, having gestated, having formed as a nation in the nation of Egypt. They went as a family, they emerged as a nation and fully fledged. They come out of Egypt and out of slavery into their relationship with God. A journey out of slavery, but into a walk by faith. And they would have the events of their deliverance to look back on. Indeed, the Jewish people still look back on their exodus through the waters of the Red Sea as that seismic foundation moment where God delivered them. This is a long passage and it's a whole book's worth of story. And this is a short lunchtime service, so let's be realistic about what we can focus on in the passage. Tucked away in the middle of this passage, there are some key verses that I invite you to reflect on with me. In verses 13 to 15, let me read them again. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. So let me invite you to reflect with me on three phrases in that passage. The first one is stand firm. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. You know, sometimes when we're surrounded by chaos or events out of our control, what God calls us to do is to stand firm, to stand in faith and to trust God. When we can't control events or circumstances, then perhaps all we can do is to stand firm, to hold our ground as Christian men and women and to say, Lord, my trust is in you. I could panic, I could flee in every direction, but I choose to stand firm. And Moses' instruction to the people was that in amongst all of the circumstances that might disturb or distract them, Egyptians behind them, a sea blocking their way in front of them, the potential for their own death and demise right there, barely having escaped Egypt, and Moses said, stand firm. What does that look like for you in your life? What does it look like for you to stand firm in the face of events that are out of your control, whether in your own life or in the lives of those you care about, whether in world affairs where it feels that everything is in chaos? Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The second is that powerful little verse in chapter 14 in sorry in verse 14 where it says the Lord will fight for you you need only to be still it's pretty similar to the stand firm in some respects it takes courage and it takes faith to hold on to that verse I've been talking a lot about this verse with a friend who's been going through some very troubling and difficult times and I've given him that verse time after time after time Because sometimes we might be tempted to fight our own corner, to plead our own defense, to take matters into our own hands. And yes, there might be justice involved and and maybe there is a rightness that we need to pursue. But sometimes the most powerful spiritual argument can be where we say, Lord, you call me to turn the other cheek. You call me, Lord, to love my enemy. You call me to forgive. You call me to do everything that is counter to my human nature, which is to fight my corner and defend my cause. And here, God's word through Moses was quite simple. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And sometimes it's a question of taking a situation back to the Lord and saying, Lord, I can't solve this. I can't fix this. I can't vindicate my name or the person or the people that I'm concerned about. Is it possible to say, 
The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Because being still, like standing firm, are statements of faith that say, Lord, I trust in you to be the one to be my shield and my defender. I trust in you to be the one to look after and provide for me. Because that's what a life of faith is. It's trusting in the God we cannot see, who's undertaken to meet our needs, who knows just as surely as he clothes the lilies of the field and feeds the bird of the air, he knows what you need. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. And thirdly, Moses, uh, rather in verse 15, the Lord says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? So we, we don't have Moses cry. We hear what Moses is telling the, the Israelites to do to stand firm and to trust God and to be still. But clearly, at the same time, Moses is crying out to the Lord saying, Lord, help, what? Where do we go? What do we do? Tell me, I'm leading these people and I don't know what to do. And so the Lord says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Which might seem like a cruel taunt when there's nowhere to move on to. And yet... God was calling a response of faith from Moses that said, you know, instead of tearing your hair out and, and crying out to me and lamenting about the problem, take a step of faith. Take a step of faith. Tell the Israelites to move on. Crazy instructions when you think about it. And yet sometimes... When we're faced with the impossible and we can't see the whole way ahead, all we can see is one step ahead of us. We'll take that one step. What's the one step that you can take? What's the one step that you can take to move on, whether it's in your situation or out of your struggle? What's the one step that you can take? And ask God to show you where the next one is and the next one and the next one. And it was only as Moses took that step and raised his staff and held his hand out over the sea that the waters parted. Now, let's note a very significant difference between uh, Disney's The Prince of Egypt and what actually happened. <laughs> Disney has it. I think it was Disney or maybe, or maybe I'm doing it as a service. Maybe it was Warner Brothers. Doesn't matter. Whoever did it. As soon as Moses' staff is held out over the water, the water leaps in a giant spume-like fountain and in parts, and there is a channel to go through. That's not how the Bible describes it. What actually happened was that Moses raised his staff and held his hand out over the water, and it looked like nothing had happened. Have you ever prayed a prayer and it looks and feels like nothing's happened? And you think, well, what was the point of that? And when Moses made his grand gesture of faith to move on and to hold up his staff and hold his hand over the water, it looked like nothing had happened except all that night the wind blew and parted the waters so that by first light there was a channel through the water with water piled on each side which enabled them to go through. And so they went through, but only after holding out in faith and patience because they had few other options. They had the pillar of cloud behind them, which was giving light to them and darkness to the Egyptians. They had God's protection for the time being as he divided them from the Egyptians. But it took time and faith and patience for the waters to part and for the way to become clear. And maybe that's true sometimes for us. We can't see other than the first step where the next one might be. And it takes time for the way to become clear. And then, of course, the Israelites passed through their birth canal into their life as a nation. And the Egyptians tried to follow them. And, of course, we read that God actively intervened to cause chaos amongst the Egyptian forces. He threw them into confusion, having separated them from the Israelites by the pillar of cloud. He now threw the army into confusion and jammed the wheels of the chariots 
to the extent that even the Egyptians recognized that the Israelite God was acting for them and they said, let's get away. You know, one of the things that has encouraged me so much as we've certainly here, and no doubt you have too, wherever you maybe worship on a Sunday, but where we've been praying for the situation between Russia and Ukraine is just hearing story after story after story of uh, failure on the Russian forces, of confusion, of them losing the coordinates, running out of fuel, of things breaking or jamming or people giving up. Don't imagine that your prayers are not being heard or answered because we have evidence from this passage, if we needed it, that God is perfectly capable of disrupting an armed force intent on a brutal, unjust pursuit by disrupting the mechanics of that pursuit. So if you need any scriptural encouragement to ask God to disrupt an unjust war and to send the oppressors back, then take this passage and turn it into prayer for the Ukrainians or indeed about the Russian situation. A little earlier, just before I came out for the service, I was just checking the news as I often do before I take a service just in case there's anything important I missed that I should be aware of. And the BBC uh, has little mini videos that they, that they line up and, and one of those is very encouraging footage of a whole load of Ukrainian civilians marching forwards <laughs> as a series of Russian armed vehicles were forced to reverse back <laughs> in the city of Kherson. And so ordinary civilians literally marching back the armed vehicles of the Russians. And I read of encouraging signs of some territory being retaken on the outskirts of Kyiv today. But nonetheless, we continue to pray. And our mandate for prayer comes here, in this passage, as we recognize that one oppressive nation seeking to destroy or reclaim another and to make them slaves all over again discovered the deliverance of God as in faith they stood firm, as in faith they uh, trusted God, and as in faith they moved on one step at a time. It's not an exact parallel, and I'm not suggesting that the Ukrainians are the people of Israel. But God cares about justice, and God cares about oppression. And I am utterly convinced, as I think uh, everyone I've, ever, I've spoken to about this is, that it seems clear to me where God's help uh, may be expected. And so as you go back into your ordinary daily situation, what will you be able to stand firm and trust God in? Where will you need to take a step? Because sometimes we just cry out and cry out and cry out, but God says, well, take a step and see if I'm going to help you or not. I won't show you the whole answer until I see that you'll take a step of faith in my direction first. Where are you in this story? Where might you find encouragement and hope? And if it doesn't speak to you, how might it inform your prayers for a situation of injustice in the world as we continue to seek God and trust him for deliverance for a people unfairly oppressed by a na nation bent on making them their slaves in a modern contemporary way? Let's pray together. Loving God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for this dramatic passage which reminds us that in times of extreme crisis and need, you are to be trusted. Our instinct is to panic and flap, to cry out and despair, to doubt and to worry that you won't be there to help when we really need you. But you call us, Lord, to stand firm. You call us to trust you and to be still in that trust. You call us to take such steps as we can and look to you to show us the next ones. And today, Lord, in this little time of prayer, we lift up the nation of Ukraine before you. Pray for refugees and those suffering and bereaved. Pray for the, uh, particularly the city of Mariupol and all those who are trapped within it. We give thanks for little victories and we trust for the end of a war that seems unjust in every way. We pray that you will thwart the attempts and endeavours of an oppressive nation to swallow up a neighbour in this way. And we pray, Father, 
that justice will be done, that a people will be able to be set free again, and that there might be healing of a nation. Lord, hear our prayer. Constrain and drive back every evil force that would seek to multiply suffering and carnage in this situation. And all we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing verses 3 and 4 of our hymn as we draw our service to a close. And so now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you all this day and forever. Amen. Amen. <laughs>